Hi, this is David Henty. Um, I'm in charge of training at Archer in general, but um, I'd just like to introduce this um, this session, which has been given by friend, uh, Fred Mendonca from um, OpenCFD. So I'm very pleased that he can give us a presentation on uh, the newest developments in OpenFoam. Because I know we, we will see OpenFoam is, is installed on Archer, and um, I know it's used by a lot of people, so it's great to know what the, the recent developments are. So Fred's going to give the main talk. I'll just give a very few slides at the end, just um, just covering some of the issues with running open foam in practice on Archer. But I'll just hand over to Fred now for, for the main for the main talk. If you want to ask a question, it's probably best if you use chat, and Claire can um, can pass it on. Okay. Hi, my name is Fred Mendonca. Thanks to David for the introduction. Um, my role here at uh, Open uh, CFD is really director of the operations of OpenFoam, uh, which is covering um, uh, development of the code, uh, release of the code, maintenance of the code, etc. Um, uh, I'll try to give you as many details as I possibly can about the infrastructure of uh, the OpenFoam releases. Uh, we're doing it on a very regular basis at the moment, so it's great to be able to have the opportunity through David and the team at Archer uh, to, to, to be able to, uh, to to give you some insights on on, on what we're doing and what regularity. Um, you see there are five core developers, essentially uh, the, 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 the guys that, whose names you see there. Uh, Andrew Heather is, is, is lead developer. He's uh, uh, been with the organization here at OpenCFT for about 10 years. Years. Matthias Janssens is, uh, I'm sure you'll recognize the name, is in charge of Snappy X Mesh and a lot of the parallelization efforts uh, for uh, OpenFOM. Um, uh, has been with the project since the beginning in 2004 and even before that. Uh, Sergio Ferreras um, is based in the San Diego office and is concentrating mainly on uh, multi-phase and combustion type applications and developments. Mark Olison is a, a very new entrant to the team, uh, joined about a year and a half ago, uh, but even prior to joining uh, OpenCFD ESI, uh, has been part of the Open Foam infrastructure for more than 10 years. Uh, Prashant Sukha is very much the guy who's uh, working on the maintenance uh, structure uh, testing um, and, and QAing of OpenFoam uh, every time it's released. Um, I, I, just as a bit of a joke, making OpenFoam great, it's a prolific code already, and many of you are clearly using it to great dynamics. Um, but uh, we're here talking about uh, continuing the pr pr proliferation of OpenFoam. Um, the, the, the way that we're doing it at OpenCFD is uh, essentially to acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of history behind OpenFoam. We're standing on the shoulder of giants, um, many, many giants whose numerical methods and, and physical models have found their way into OpenFoam. Um, uh, last year, I concentrated on uh, uh, the fact that ESI and OpenCFD are very much taking the uh, the mantle to become custodians of OpenFoam and future releases. And uh, because it's a prolific code, uh, at the end of the day, we want it used, and we want it used in a professional way. And there are many professional organizations also using it. So in terms of quality assurance, we're uh, essentially aiming to be delivering, continuing to deliver a very professional code. So that's my introductory slide. Um, open CFD as part of ESI, uh, the custodian open form, has a global operation. So I think you can be pretty sure that uh, what we're experiencing in the UK with respect to open form is actually experienced on a very uniform basis everywhere across the world. It's available, downloadable by anybody, anywhere. Um, and we try to make some uniformity of quality assurance and structures uh, across the globe. So um, that's part of the statement uh, behind making open form professional. Um, it's obviously supported by uh, services like uh, like training and support and, and consulting. But at the end of the day, we're concentrating here on uh, making open form uh, development as prolific as we can make it. Um, that is really saying the same as, as I just said. OK, um, this slide is talking about uh, CFD democratization through open form. Um, the reason it is so prolific is that the cost that was experienced by um, organizations, whether they be academic or commercial organizations, uh, in deployment of CFD was becoming um, prohibitively expensive. And we see from this chart, and this is uh, uh, donated to us by one of our, our customers, 
essentially saying is that the open foam uh, interaction point is probably one third of the cost of deploying commercial CFT. Um, in terms of full operations, that's uh, buying machines, uh, providing support for it, uh, running it on, on HPC, etc. Um, so you can see the price point is, is, is very, very economical, uh, which makes it a very, very attractive democratization option, especially because we're seeing through 2016 to through, through 2018, uh, pretty much an exponential growth in the use of CFD um, in, 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 in commercial forms, in, in companies, and also for academic research. We're also trying to place this into uh, a kind of a productionization um, uh, sequence, uh, meaning that the computational part will be one in a line of a process, um, and that process involves uh, handling geometry, uh, making a mesh, running the analysis, and doing some post-processing, and that may feed all the way back through to the beginning again if you're doing some kind of optimization. So this is where open form and CFD democratization is, is really helping to proliferate CFD um, worldwide and across many sectors. Okay. My, my my next slide now is uh, is is a credibility slide. The credibility uh, slide essentially is saying that uh, Open CFD owns the trademark. So we take the reputation of Open Foam really very very seriously, and to that effect, um, we want to make sure that uh, as we're developing the code and releasing it every six months, that the development and release cycle is is professionally delivered. Uh, that any new developments are um, as as well delivered at the point of uh, first release as possible. Um, unfortunately, that there are always going to be some kind of issues with the software, so we try to uh, find and fix those uh, bugs as quickly as possible, and then release them with the next release in the six monthly cycle. Um, what, what we did starting about two years ago was a complete overhaul of the quality assurance procedures, and that's the testing associated with quality assurance, um, which now means that we're incorporating uh, daily, weekly, and pre-release regression tests on an industrial scale. The other thing that uh, we've made available is uh, uh, release and development repositories. So that means even during the cycle of development, if you register on this GitLab repository uh, site, which is uh, develop.openbook.com, essentially you'll be given access to even the development repositories pre-release. They comprise uh, a master branch, that is the, that, that is the release version, uh, develop branch for kind of on, ongoing developments. And, and it also means that we're merging in with other contributors to OpenForm, uh, both the org um, contributions as well as community repositories, which are third parties that, uh, having appreciated OpenForm as a, a good platform to be doing development, would then like to contribute their developments back to the uh, standardized and official release uh, every six months. So we have a repository available for third party developers to contribute their, their contributions. Six monthly releases have been happening on a um, uh, regular basis now for a consecutive four occasions. So we started this really at the end of 2015 or early 2016. And we've decided to release them uh, in June and December of every year. And we've uh, changed the naming structure so that it has, after the V, the version, uh, two digits indicating the year and, and two digits indicating the month. So 1606 means uh, the June release in 2016. 1706, which is the latest release, is uh, the June release in 2017, which was released on 30th of June this year. Uh, here's a little bit about uh, uh, the, the quality assurance. Um, the, the overhaul of the, the, the testing essentially now means that we are running um, small unit tests of around 550 um, every night. Total execution time is about uh, four hours. So that means that any developers um, can appear the following morning having run their test loop uh, having done the de developments the previous uh, previous day um, and get a report for um, whether the code in general has uh, has broken because of their, 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 their new developments. Um, they'll get a report to say, okay, this bit is broken or, or, or everything has a green light. So these are nightly tests. We also run weekly tests, which would take approximately two days. So ideal to run over a weekend, there are approximately 300 tests of those. And pre-release, we'll have um, at least, and that's growing, at least 20 client tests, which would be uh, several multi-millions or tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of cells cases running steady state and transient. Um, and the idea here is to assure uh, the professional users of the code that um, the, the, the subsequent release is going to give uh, some quality of answer which is not deviating from the previous release 
to, 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 to some accepted and given tolerance. So that's uh, how we've overhauled overhaul the, the quality assurance testing procedure. Okay, um, what I'd like to do is, since we first started releasing uh, OpenFOAM on a six monthly basis, is just to tell you a little bit about what's gone in the solver over the past two years. Um, we're kind of catching up as this is the first Archer uh, webinar that, that, that I've done. Um, but in subsequent uh, re re release webinars, we'll only cover the uh, additional six months development uh, rather than the full two years here. So if you just bear with me on this one, uh, the first release version three, before we change the, the, the numbering sequence, um, had uh, quite a lot of pre-processing and meshing uh, um, enhancements that were performed over kind of two, two, man, two, two, two years, which is about eight or nine man years worth. Um, solver enhancements in terms of volitionization and uh, heat transfer, boundary conditions, turbulence, runtime controls, and a lot of, lots of post-processing. What I do want to say is that with version three in January 2016 was the first time that we took um, uh, external contributions and uh, included them in the mainstream release version of OpenFOAM. Okay, in, in June of last year, um, a couple of the highlights of what we introduced were uh, message passing enhancements to improve the scalability um, of OpenFOAM for HPC. So I think uh, previously uh, too, too many people were um, reporting that there was a kind of a scalability bottleneck up to about a, a thousand cores, and then they wouldn't really get any scalability beyond that. Um, working with some worldwide collaborators, uh, it, it quickly became obvious that uh, message passing routines needed a little bit of uh, fine tuning. So by changing um, gather scatter operations and all to all processor communications, uh, we, we quickly saw that uh, the scalability, uh, even up to let's say six to uh, 12,000 processors was uh, much better than it was before. So these enhancements are already in version 1606, which is about a year old. Um, we introduced some performance profiling um, and uh, community uh, contributions at that point were uh, uh, this thing called uh, divergence-free synthetic eddy method for uh, inlet turbulence. You can see the um, correlated turbulence coming out in the inlet, sustaining itself until it hits the object, which could be a building or a side view mirror um, or, or whatever. Um, other enhancements were in multi-physics, uh, particularly to do with, uh, in, in this case, aeroacoustics and aeroacoustics damping. So introducing damping so that uh, any uh, acoustic signal coming from a, a source, yeah, there's a cylinder shedding vortices and an acoustic source, um, that the signals when they hit the boundary uh, do not cause any um, undue reflections. And of course, we can guarantee that by, by damping the signal before it hits the boundary. So that's aeroacoustics damping in 1606. Um, additions in the December release were um, uh, highlights are, are, are meshing and uh, meshing with morphing together with, with AMI. Um, we started to look at uh, VOF uh, sampling and Lagrangian particle tracking uh, in, in the sense of uh, one, once, once you calculate primary atomization using VOF and LES, then uh, you can sample the, uh, the, the VOF uh, then to agglomerate those and uh, cap capture that, those statistics to be able to run a, a, a downstream Lagrangian particle tracking um, algorithm. So this VOS sampling and Lagrangian sampling was introduced in, in, in December. There was a new concept on uh, uh, combustion, which is the introduction of the eddy dissipation concept for combustion. Um, uh, some extensive wave modeling, including wave damping contributions from IH Cantabria in Spain. Uh, improvements to the, uh, the, 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 the meshing and AMI and morphing that you can see on the top right animation. Um, substantial documentation improvements. Um, what, what if, um, uh, the, the, the main suggestions or criticisms uh, that, that I've been receiving is that uh, um, the documentation in, in open form could do with, with some enhancements. So we started that project uh, about a year and a half ago. And if you look on openform.com, you'll see a new section, um, which is some, some, some additional um, documentation on turbulence models, boundary conditions, numerical schemes, etc. And we'll continue to populate uh, those additional sections uh, um, as time goes, uh, hopefully eventually to, to cover all the, um, uh, the, 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 the missing parts of the documentation uh, as it stands. The other thing that we introduced last December was something called a community repository. Uh, and that's a formal way now of being able to, uh, if you're a third party, to contribute back into the OpenFOAM project um, and have that uh, measured, 
qualified, optimized, and then introduced as a mainstream part of the code. So this is done in close collaboration with our developers. It starts off in a community repository, which is exposing that particular uh, contribution to the wider public. And then together with the developers, we will then integrate that into the mainstream, probably in the next, next release cycle. Um, and then it becomes automatically maintained by, uh, by the development team on subsequent releases. The other thing that we were, were, were quite pleased to be able to announce uh, uh, around, around December time last year was an initiative by uh, Dr. Uh, Josef Naj uh, from, from Austria, who uh, got together something like 25 contributors who have been spending a lot of their time academic and otherwise gathering tutorials and examples that are helping people to climb the open form learning curve as quickly as they possibly can. So you'll see a link on our website, essentially to uh, Andy Heather's and uh, Joseph Nagy's uh, <clears throat> efforts on uh, providing tutorials. Um, so there are about 25 contributors, maybe 100 tutorials available in, in various forms. And if you go to the um, contributions section in openforum.com, you'll be able to see a direct link to the tutorials gathering uh, uh, sequence and, and documentation um, uh, by, these, by these two gentlemen. Okay, uh, let me progress now on to the latest release, 1906, released on the 30th of June this year. Um, the areas that we've continued to add to are the list you see here, uh, meshing in particular overset, so I'll talk about overset first, but also physics and solvers, boundary condition numerics, and uh, usability in general. So I'll start with, with, with overset. Um, this is probably the first general and public manifestation of uh, overset in open form. Um, I think most people are familiar with the concepts that you can uh, build a mesh around an object. And if there are multiple objects, you build multiple meshes around those multiple objects. And they will sit on top of a background mesh and then interact with the background mesh depending on what the positioning or the, the motion of those objects might be. Uh, it could be one object. It could be more than one object. So uh, currently not limited into the number of uh, meshes that you can impose on this one. But of course, practically speaking, it makes sense to. Um, uh, li limit limit the number of uh, meshes or oversets that you have simply from 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 the housekeeping point of view. So that's the idea behind uh, uh, overset. Um, I guess uh, uh, that's what I just explained. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a kind of a Chin Chinook helicopter with inter 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 rotating blades. Uh, this is a, a kind of moving mixer with uh, with with two blades that. Um, the, 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 the swept area overlaps each other from, from each of those two motors. Okay, um, the capabilities on overset uh, span from steady state all the way to transient. So uh, uh, Laplacian uh, dim, dim foam uh, will allow that to be done um, for, for the most basic solver. Um, it also applies to, to simple foam. Um, so simple foam is, is to steady state. It essentially means that you could uh, build a mesh around a wing or an aerofoil um, and, and then one mesh for the background and then, then you could change the position or the attitude or the angle or the angle of attack um, just by changing the mesh um, overset compared with the background. So here's an example of this particular NACRA or aerofoil at zero incidence and taking just the mesh and rotating it uh, gives it a, uh, gives you the simulation at uh, five degrees or whatever it is you choose uh, as the latitude for the overset. So that was simp uh, s s simple steady over. Um, uh, over pimple dynamic mesh foam is the example you saw with the counter rotating uh, uh, mixing blades. Um, we, we also go into the, uh, the, the compressible and, uh, and, and, and the multi-phase. Hopefully now you'll be able to see the uh, the, the floating body tutorial for, for overset. Um, and, and this is over into dim foam. So in general, there are five solvers that are included in the overset libraries at the moment. We'll probably generalize those to extend to full capability, in, including uh, steady state compressible uh, phase and multi-phase in, in, in the very near future. Okay. Um, you know, part of our validation procedure is, is to make sure that any new functionality like overset uh, gives a, a qualified answer with respect to <clears throat> an equivalent technique. So we're looking here at uh, the, the aerofoil case again. 
running it uh, with overset and, and, an, and an equivalent uh, without overset. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the res residuals here um, compared with uh, non-overset. And the, the convergence is pretty similar, a little bit more noisy, and the residuals stay a little bit higher. That's understandable simply because you're, uh, you're, you're constraining the behavior of the, uh, the equations a, a, a little bit more in the overset region where you're communicating information. But then when you compare lift and drag, lift is uh, here here on the left and drag is uh, there, there on the right-hand side. Actually, it's the other way around. So this is drag on the left and lift on the right-hand side. You'll see that the, uh, the, the non-overset versus the overset is, is very, very close indeed. Uh, small differences are because of the fact that uh, one has chosen in this particular case to put the overset in, in, in a region where there are still flow gradients. Uh, so in that sense, the interpolation, which is close to second order, uh, will introduce some interpolation effects, which is going to give you a slightly different answer. Um, the slightly different answer at the moment is really within 0.5% in terms of lift and only 0.2 uh, counts in terms of drag. Um, OK, uh, also comparing now overset with, uh, with a moving mesh capability um, or sliding mesh capabilities, running a similar case here, but with, with overset, is kind of giving um, uh, a, 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 an overhead of around 100%. Um, and, and that's because uh, one, one's having to recalculate the overset position and the interaction with the background mesh uh, every time step. So this is probably the maximum overhead that you'll get um, as the convenience for solving something which is much simpler to set up. Uh, and we're working on uh, Im improving that uh, th that that overhead. Uh, as much as we can. Uh, the other point about overset is, is scalability. So the ideal scalability is the straight line that uh, goes from uh, bottom left to top right. Uh, for the um, inter-dim foam case, the floating body tutorial that I just showed you, uh, the scalability that we're getting on that one up to about 120 cores is, is close to linear. At least 120 cores, the scalability is 90% at, at this instant. This is about a 3 million cell case. So up to 120 cores is a, a good scalability number. OK, uh, other release features is uh, associated in this version, that's 1606, with uh, coupling with uh, uh, FSI. Um, so, some some acoustics um, uh, improvements, especially when you um, you, you, you come across uh, non-uniform meshes. I'm here showing you uh, a vortex traveling from left to, to right, which is essentially going through uh, regions of, of coarsening and refining. And you can see that the acoustical footprint of this vortex is, is minimized, that you're not really seeing any um, uh, large spurious numerics coming from uh, the migration of the vortex left to right uh, as it goes through a finer and a coarser mesh. One of the new features that came in December um, on, on uh, free surface flows uh, was this concept called uh, ISO ad vector um, initiated by uh, Johan Ronby at DHI. Um, essentially, it's, it, it, it's able um, to, to retain the, the sharpness of the interface capture uh, r rather nicely. But when you compare it with the, 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 the previous kind of best version, um, when, you, when you take a, a blob and you rotate the blob, and, and the blob has a notch cut of it, so it looks like a kind of a keyhole. Rotating the keyhole first clockwise and then anti-clockwise, the clockwise rotation will create distortion. And then the anti-clockwise back to the, the original hopefully should retain the, the, the original shape. Uh, previous Interfoam was introducing some distortion in the keyhole. Um, uh, just in terms of accuracy, ISO vector seems to be producing much more consistent um, recovering of the initial solution uh, after you've, you've been through the clockwise and the anti-clockwise rotation. So that's a nice method to be able to introduce this version. There are uh, other boundary conditions, for example, um, uh, wave modeling and tsunami modeling, uh, again, by an external contributor, that's IH Cantabria. Another new feature here is uh, is the solution of an electrical potential equation. Uh, the main reason for doing this was uh, electrical potential in, in a solid will then create a heating of that solid. So we have here a, a dual effect. One is once you've computed the electrical potential field V, 
then there will be a source term in in your enthalpy equation uh, for, the, for the for the solid, and the uh, the source term is what you see you see there coming from the electrical potential field solution uh, that has been introduced in the latest version of OpenFOAM. Um, in terms of general usability, uh, about two years ago, we were the first to recognize that uh, uh, OpenFOAM is used prolifically across, across many platforms. Um, what we wanted to do was, um, okay, when you're running on HPCs, that's great, but you don't want to do your testing on HPC. You might do that on your, uh, on, on your Windows or, or, or Linux uh, desktop or even your, your, your uh, Mac OS laptop. Um, what we what we did was to t to take uh, introduce the environment for taking an image of the, uh, the, the 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 Linux version and and then running that um, that that image um, on, on a virtual box which is very lightweight virtual virtual box in other words uh, minimal overhead in running the the, the virtualization um, the technology that enabled that was Docker and that allowed us then to provide open foam. Um, guaranteed to give you on all platforms exactly the same answer across the platforms, uh, but but on disparate uh, operating systems, uh, uh, Unix, Windows, and 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 Mac OS. Um, nice to be able to report that uh, s since our first release, uh, Windows 10 has now introduced an, an, a native um, uh, U Ubuntu capability, which means that you can take that image and then run it without any. Uh, virtualization in Windows. I'll skip through a few of these, um, basically because I don't want to spend too much time in, in, in telling you all, all the features. Um, you could interrogate those features in openform.com if you just go to the, uh, the latest version download um, or description, then, then, then you'll see all the capabilities that have, that have been released. Okay, um, let me just continue as, as follows. Uh, the next release, uh, this is talking a little bit about the, the, the roadmap, we'll continue to look at uh, overset mesh, FSI, boundary conditions, parallel IO, um, HPC optimizations, uh, but we're gonna continue with community contributions. So anybody out there who's doing some, um, some really good work and, and would like their, their work incorporated in, in OpenFORM, uh, then the place to go is uh, develop.openform.com. Um, register on that site, get in touch with our developers, uh, put it in the com community repository, and, 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 and then we'll, in dialogue, kind of take it from there. Okay, um, because we're uh, in the infrastructure here of Archer, I just wanted to um, make, make one final point uh, in terms of HPC usability. Um, OpenFOAM is university, universally prolifically used. Um, th this is one great example um, of use of the standard open form um, for real engineering work. So this is Interform used for um, modeling the tsunami that was experienced in Japan in 2012. Um, so here you see uh, the, uh, the, the the local site or, or the, uh, the cityscape that was influenced by uh, by, by the catastrophic wave event. Um, Snappy hex mesh was used to uh, discretize this 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 domain here. There you see the uh, snappy hex mesh surface imprint. Um, here are some details of the uh, the waterways and the channels and the tsunami barriers that uh, that were built uh, around and approaching the city, uh, with some local city detail, including the buildings. Um, previous modeling attempts were based around two dimensional. And the approximation for um, uh, using two-dimensional methods um, was, you can see, at least 50% less than the, the actuality in terms of this near point measurement um, uh, in, in the event of the, the, the actual tsunami. Uh, the open foam modeling, um, in, in fact, pr produced a, a pretty accurate uh, um, height of liquid um, in, 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 in the near land vicinity. So here, here's Interfoam. I, I hope the animation is visible to you all. Um, here's the animation of the tsunami wave approaching the, 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 the cityscape. Um, while this animation is running, the reason I'm showing you this is because you can see the level of um, uh, almost mesoscale detail, um, which, which, which is really hundreds of millions of cells um, that really benefits from 
uh, from HPC utilization, for which we need to make sure that uh, OpenForm is, is pretty scalable. So these would be typical of the sort of large scale um, simulations that in industry out there is, is, is producing. Okay, um, also including meter scale, uh, Kind of, kind of local weather modeling. Um, this particular simulation is, is, is picking up a, uh, a, a local tornado. Um, and once you capture the, the fluid dynamics around the, the, the local tornado, which we see here, um, then you can reproduce that to understand how a, a tornado event might be impacting a certain building. Here we're seeing it hitting a square block building. Um, but now you have a repeatable system that comes from a macro modeling captured for uh, Microscale modeling. Okay, he, he, here is the is the statistic. So taking uh, OpenFORM out of the box, uh, even up to forty nine thousand processors, we are seeing scale, scalability uh, of of sixty sixty five percent. With with a small amount of optimization of the release code, uh, essentially related to I O, we were able to recover uh, in excess of eighty percent scalability, up to one hundred thousand cores. So um, that puts us very close to better scale perf performance um, uh, with, with open form. Um, I was going to say today, in fact, uh, th this result is a year old, so we're slightly more advanced than than, than even this uh, this production point. Okay, so I, I hope I've given you a, a good and general oversight uh, in, into what uh, we're doing with OpenFOAM in terms of its regular releases, uh, its new functionalities, um, its scalability, and what might be uh, useful for you guys uh, in uh, the Archer community uh, in, in terms of using OpenFOAM. I'm going to finish with this slide just to say uh, you'll continue to see us uh, hopefully ar ar around the country, around the world. Um, uh, if you uh, are not already attending, it would be great to see you at the next OpenForm conference, which is in Wiesbaden near Frankfurt next week. Uh, we have keynote speakers from uh, um, industry and academia and from uh, the, the long, long-standing long giants that I mentioned earlier, uh, one of which undoubtedly is uh, Professor Phil Rowe. So he's going to be coming to talk to us uh, about upwinding methods in general. We have Professor Gian Kuglu uh, on optimization methods, uh, Professor Beal on uh, open form applications in fuel cells, and uh, Dr. Carl Mer Meredith on fire suppression uh, and fire modeling in general. So I think uh, w with that, hopefully you've got a good flavor of uh, what we're doing with open form. Um, Six monthly releases. So just to summarize, uh, essentially a, a fully professional and QA development scheme. Um, and uh, we'll continue to interact uh, with, with the community at large. Uh, anything that you'd like to contribute back to us, you're very welcome to do that. And um, the, 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 the final comment is we, we are concentrating on HPC utilization. So together with the SARTA community, I'd love to hear any feedback on your scalability experiences. And if they are not as good spec, let's together to try to improve those. So uh, David, with that, I'll, 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 I'll pause in case there are any questions. Back over to you. That's great. So I, I'll say that I just post a chat message. I'll just give a very few quick slides, um, just covering some specifics about Arch, which just might be worth doing in advance. And then, um, and then I will open up for questions. I just wanted to cover a few issues regarding open, using open firm on Archer. So first of all, open firms installed centrally. These are the versions we have. I don't think, maybe not the current. So the, the main source of, and where I basically got all the information in this talk, as I said, I'm not really an open firm user, although I have, I'm aware of some of the issues we've had. Um, but the Archer documentation software open firm has a lot of useful information on it. Um, these are the versions which are currently installed. But I said that, you know, if you want any other versions, please contact the Archer help desk. I'll give the email address at the end. We're, we're happy to work with you to get up whatever applications you might need. Um, the important point about this table is that um, the pre and post processing versions are specifically compiled non-parallel versions, which are, which are designed to be run on the serial nodes. The serial nodes of Archer are, just, are there for pre and post processing and compilation and such like. They're not part of the main compute, parallel compute node uh, nodes. So, so we have a couple of versions here where there are special versions, where special installations of, of, of open from particularly for those pre and post processing tasks. So just to say, do you want to run serial or parallel? Well, of course, you know, uh, Fred um, um, presented some scalability 
uh, data there showing you can run on many, many thousands of CPU cores. So the compute nodes on Archer obviously have MPI, standard distributed memory parallelization, but locally on a node they have parallelization through vectorization. So uh, if you're going to use any of the parallel solvers, the parallel utilities, or the serial utilities as part of a job, you might want to do something uh, in midway through a run, then you should use the, um, the, the parallel solvers. However, our pre and post processing nodes have a, have a lot of memory. That's what they're there for. And so um, obviously if you have pre and post processing that requires lots of memory, you want to use that. So for example, there's a routine called reconstruct power, which I believe is, is to do with the decomposition, which is serial. Um, now these versions, the versions here are accessed in different ways. Some of them have modules, some of them require running a script, but that's all explicitly there on the documentation. So please refer to that. Open phone performance, uh, we've seen uh, the, the major issue in Archer is file I.O. I mean, Archer has a very, very good interconnect. And so I, I expect that, you know, if you, the, the kind of scalability which Fred has demonstrated, you would be able to realize on Archer from the hardware. The issue we have is through file I.O. almost universally. And the issue is that each process in open phone parallel simulation, and if you're running on, you know, hundreds or many thousands of CPU cores, you will have many thousands of processes. The number of files output by open, open phone is the number of output fields times the number of output times times the number of processes. So if you're running on many thousands of processes and many hundreds of time steps, then you're getting hundreds of thousands of files. So that creates a large number of small files. However, Archer has a Lustre file system, and Lustre is optimized, which is a parallel file system, is, is optimized for reading and writing a small number of large files. So particularly opening and closing large numbers of files can be slow, because although the, parallel, the file system is parallel with many disks, there's a single metadata server which has, it, you know, which has the unified global view of the file system. When you create a new file, you need to tell the metadata server, you know, to have a consistent view, please create this file. So there's a single potential bottleneck there. And also large numbers of process of reading and writing files can contend for access to the file system. Again, largely because of this, this metadata server, um, which, um, which stores the information of what a file is, where it is and such like. How can we address that? Well, first of all, always clear up after a run to remove unnecessary files. The Archer has been around for several, for many years, four or five years. Um, I think 2013 we started, so it's over four years. Uh, and file system is filling up after many years usage. And um, don't st so so please clean up file. If you don't need the files, just just delete things after a run, either in the job script or afterwards. It's maybe best to done done. Um, maybe best done afterwards, but please have a way of cleaning up your files. Um, don't stripe files across multiple disks. Um, you know, there's, if you have a large number of small files, there's no point in each file itself being stored in parallel across lots of disks. You've got plenty of parallelism because you've got large numbers of files. Uh, actually, that's the default setting now. So the default setting now is not to stripe files, but previously the default setting was to stripe files. So that's something you might want to look at. Uh, so if you're an open phone user, you may want to change your settings because your directory settings may be to create multiple stripes. Again, there's information on how to do that on the web pages. Things you can do in terms of controlling your, your, your run, you can increase the write interval, so don't write as frequently. Write in binary format, which reduces the amount of data. Uh, for steady state solutions, there's no, presumably there's no need to keep lots of intermediate states. If you're interested in the final state, you can do that by setting purge write equals one. Uh, oh, and I've done burn binary format for the fields twice. Apologies, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. I think actually I've, I've um, I've probably done something, there was probably another hint from, on the manual pages, which I uh, possibly miscopied in my haste to do these files. So um, I'll, I'll, but again, these are all on the, whoops, these are all on the, on the documentation, uh, on, on the documentation pages. There's another issue that, that um, if you're, because Arch, um, Archer, because open phone uses shared libraries, they're dynamically loaded. And that can mean that when your executable starts up, it spends a lot of time loading dynamic libraries. So if you see your program being very, very slow to start up, but then running reasonably well, that may be due to this initial stage of, of, of loading these dynamically linked libraries. And again, there's a, a, um, a package called DLFM, which was actually mainly investigated for improving the performance of Python codes, but fundamentally it's there to increase the speed at which dynamic libraries can be propagated to the compute nodes. Can you contact the help desk and we can help you investigate this package. 
So the main thing is check the documentation. All the information I have here, I just got from the documentation page. And if in doubt, contact, contact the help there. That's support at archer.ac.uk. David, I skimmed over that point a little bit. Uh, you may have come across the 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 um, uh, Adios. So yes, I saw your slide. You done Adios. Um, I meant to mention that I saw you done Adios development, and that's the kind of thing which what well, you might we need to investigate. There's some on the documentation currently mentions HDF five work, uh, but Adios is you know a higher level, probably more 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 flexible. So we should maybe look at that. So again, uh, that's if there is support for um you know, if there is support within the code for, for for coping with parallel file systems and that's what the IDOS layer does that's definitely something to look at and, and let's let's take that discussion offline i think uh, yeah uh, it, it's well worth assessing you you showed scalability up to very very high numbers of cores and you improved it with some io improvements what machine were those were those um scalability was that scalability data taken on uh, they, they were run in Japan on the Fujitsu K computer. So on the K computer, fine. Okay. But I know we did some benchmarking here on Archer several years ago, and we 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 found that for um, for very large meshes, we were able to get good um, good scalability on the calculation phase uh, in the solve part. But the thing which we had to grab the we I think we had to, to deal with most in terms of overall end-to-end -end performance was making sure the IO was uh, the IO was was, was um, working correctly yeah and and that's where adios uh, undoubtedly helps so we're seeing for certain applications um, factors of improvement um, 250 with uh, Lagrangian droplets for example was running five times faster on a 10 million cell case I should point out on the file system part, you might think that um, on Archer, this is Archer specific point, you might think, well, I'm, you know, I may be creating a lot of files, but um, actually, you know, I don't have a lot of data there. But on Archer, with so many users and with it being a parallel file system where files are stored on multiple disks, it's actually the sheer number of files is becoming an issue over time. People have created, as well as data being an issue, it's actually the fact that people have created so many files is also becoming a starting to become a factor. So, so you know, you may think, oh, I don't not don't have that much data in my open foam simulations, but it's actually the number of files which is becoming an issue on Archer, uh, as, simply because we're you know we're over four years into the service and people are there are you know countless millions, I don't know how many millions of, maybe Claire knows, but clank, countless millions of files on the system. That's user files, that's multiplied by, if they're striped across parallel disks, that's multiplied by the number of disks, because that, that then creates more and more files. So that, that that has become a recent issue, which we're trying to keep an eye on. So thanks everyone and uh, goodbye.